Tankas. Tankas are exactly the same structure and exactly the same benefit as statues. Only one is longer lasting, one is shorter lasting. On a tanka, it contains the body, speech, and mind of an enlightened being or enlightened beings. Tankas can be something that we commission that the deities or the imagers or whatever is, has a special connection, affinity, or relationship to us. Maybe it was some deity or practice that was assigned to us by our lamas. So when we create a tanka of them, we keep it for our visualization and practices as an object of offering and merit. It's tremendously beneficial, especially if it's connected to us. But in general, any tankas, images of the enlightened beings, is very, very beneficial, very holy. It is said, it is said that even a simple line drawing of the Buddha, no colors, nothing, just a line drawing, and a person who has no faith and understanding, and they're angry, they're angry about something, and they just happen to glance at that picture. Just that glance, nothing else. It is said that it plants the seeds of receiving teachings and initiations from 10 million Buddhas. So 10 million Buddhas is a little, wow. But symbolically, what it means is it plants the seeds for us to meet a teacher that will bring us the full enlightenment. That's the power of tankas, power of images. And the images in the Tibetan tradition of tanka painting is not just sporadically made. Each deity, each figure must correspond to measurements. Tik. It has to accord with specific colors, iconography, symbols, structure. It is not arbitrarily made. Because why? They have been written down by very advanced high lamas who if you follow these specific rules of iconography and measurements, the benefits from these beings are even more. It's a vehicle, it's a Samaya vehicle for them to, the wisdom beings to bless us. So when you see the deities, when you see the images, they most likely have relationship to each other or to you. And to view them and to see them plants seeds of enlightenment in our mind. And for the nomadic people of Tibet and many parts of Tibet, it is not practical because they, they move with the grazing of their herds of animals. So to have a lot of clumsy statues with no disrespect intended, it was very difficult. So the lay people very much liked tankas. Why? It was, it was very, very um, what's that? Easy to Easy transport. You just roll it up, roll it down, and then wherever you plant your tent for the next two, three months, then you're able to set up an instant altar. Because Tibetans cannot be without an altar. They cannot be in, without an object of enlightened being in their, in their uh, residence. And so when they hang up the tanka, and a lot of them, they have two or three or many, they, it depends on the household, the person. And they hang up the tanka, and immediately in front, they'll set up in the tent their altars. That's the first priority. Immediately make offerings. They'll go down to the river, walk miles or wherever it is, and bring fresh water back and make offerings. Flowers and all that is not easy in some parts of Tibet. And they sit in front and immediately they make offerings of juniper, incense, outside the tent. And make offerings of the three jewels and ask for their blessings and to continue their connection with the three jewels. And the tankas can be of any figure. Historical figures that are enlightened like uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, Buddha Shakyamuni. It can be of the meditational deities and yidams. It can be of your particular Dharma protectors. It can be of great saints like Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Chandrakomin. Atisha. It can represent a universe within a universe, like a mandala of a deity, like a Yamataka or Vajugini mandala, which represents a complete transformed universe to be perceived by an enlightened mind. And it, it could be of um, uh, Karasiwara. It can be scenes of mystical places that can be achieved through meditation, such as Shambhala, Kichara Paradise, Gandhin Heaven, Tushita Heaven. So Tankas represent the supreme and the purest, and um, they're made from minerals. I mean, real tankas are made from minerals, natural and clean and pure. And the tanka painter is not, traditionally, now it's different because of situation and place. Traditionally, tanka painters are not allowed to have salaries. They're not allowed to say the number that they wish to have for a tanka. Oh, I, I'm going to charge them. No. What happens is that tanka painters actually paint tankas in the past for practicing dharma, for purifying the negative actions of the body, especially and to gain merits to achieve a Buddha body. So they paint tankas that other people may get the benefit of seeing enlightened beings. Why? Tankas is a bridge between us and the enlightened beings because we can't see the enlightened beings at our level yet. So tanka painters actually, they have to be very, they have a good diet. 
They hold their vows of refuge. They have good samaya to the lama, especially um, yes to their deities. And they're good in speech and action and behavior. And they do their sadhanas and practices. And when they make that kind of tanka, it's very, very blessed. Because the person themselves are pure and clean. And then the base is, is before they paint it, they put a white base on it. And the base can be mixed with holy ashes of highly enlightened beings, highly enlightened saints and masters. So tanka becomes incredible. So they, then they draw the measurements of the deities and what deities to be commissioned. And sometimes for people's sickness and ill health and obstacles, specific tankas can be commissioned to purify the karma of that person. Oh, yes. And how big the tanka is where you want to put it, how much money you have. And after the tanka painter has painted your tanka, then you go to him respectfully with a kata, with an offering of how much you feel you can offer for that product. Why? To sustain him in his livelihood or her livelihood so that they can continue doing their dharma craft. And tankas are portable. They're unique. They're very beautiful. They're simple. They're easy. They're easy to store. But they're highly significant. And they're brocaded around. Why is that? Because we like to offer the five sensory offerings that are with us. Tactile feeling is beautiful cloths and brocades. So we offer the best brocades we onto the enlightened beings, onto the enlightened beings. So in tanka form, the only way we can do it is surround it. We can't put it on it, or cover it. So we offer beautiful, beautiful brocades around the holy beings. In this case, this brocade is gold thread weaves, pure gold. So we offer it to the deities. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And then when the tanka is finished and done, then you take it to your lama or a lama, and you have it consecrated. And sometimes, if you have a very strong connection with the lama, your lama can put their handprint or their thumbprint on it. It's very, very significant. I have tankas with the handprint of Trijan Ramachi on it. It's very, very blessed. And some of the, many of the tankas come to life. In Howell, New Jersey, the Mongolian Buddhists there escaped from, um, um, in World War II from Russia, because that's where they resided. And they're all Tibetan Buddhists. And they, they rebuilt the temple and their holy images there. And there was a beautiful tanka of Benden Hamel. And I, I don't, I, I, it was really weird because I used to go into the temple nearby my house and uh, I'd be very attracted to this tanka. I used to sit in front of her and look at her and I liked her very, very much. And so um, I heard from one of the monks, my teacher wouldn't tell me, but I heard from one of the monks that this Benden Hamel is very, very special because at night they can hear her mule stamping and hoofing into the ground. So from the picture itself, many times people have heard the stamping of the hooves of her mule, because she rides on a mule. She shows that kind of, uh, um, because why? The person who painted it is the Samaya is clean. The patron themselves, the Samaya is clean. The Lama who bless it has affinity. And the Tanka has been t kept and worshiped by a person who develops compassion. So all the, cons all the necessaries match, definitely they come to life. Definitely. Some, many statues speak in Tibet. Many, many statues speak. And some statues take on an ethereal aura. You look at them, you're like, they look like they're alive. That is dependent on the practitioner. You can look at the state of your affairs and your practice by looking at your statues. But they look bland, dead, flat, just like a, a piece of stone, rock, or brass, or they look alive. And it doesn't matter whether the statues are highest quality or the lowest quality, but they reflect your spiritual practice. Definitely. And those who are stingy or miserly in making statues and making tankas and offering and using whatever, they lose out very much because making tankas and statues is a fabulous way of purifying negative karma of the body. Many and creating the cause for you to have fabulous, magnificent, charismatic, strong bodies in the future. Very, very powerful. And it plants the seeds for you to achieve Buddha's body. So in Tibet, they have a tradition of making tatas, 100,000 in their lifetime. That's one of the preliminary practices we can do. Why? Incredible Tibetans. Incredible Tibetans who make statues and images. And so they surround it with a brocade. And the brocade quality of how good is depend on how much you can offer. It can be changed later. And then the two <coughs> banners coming down is actually decorational now. But what it is, was, is that that's what originally was used to tie the tanka down in the tent. But it's become a decorational purpose. And then on top, you see it wrapped up, that's covering the tanka. Because when you cover it, 
it needs to protect the painting or else it'll scrape off. So what they do is they put a protective covering and it's very, very smart. Why? They use that as an offering too. What is that an offering? They put beautiful um, um, thin silks and they wrap it up and hold it like that to give it an appearance of a victory banner for our money. So the top of the compact is to represent a victory banner, which is an offering to the enlightened being. For example, this is medicine of it. So on top of medicine of it, you can see the victory banner. Offer to Lord medicine of it. Why? To make offerings to his enlightened state, his royal state of enlightenment. That in the future, may we become just like medicine of it. Therefore, I so people in the temple or in the center or who take care of tankas, they have a very sacred job. When they hang the tankas up, when they work on it, it is incredible. And then even when you unfurl the tankas and you put the covering on top, it's a practice. You can recite Namo Guru Be, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Damaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Guru Be, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dhamma, Namo Sangaya. You can think whatever is in the King of Prayers may come true. And then you wrap it up and put it up beautifully on top you offer a victory banner to the Buddhas. Equivalent to carrying a victory banner over a, a monarch, a Buddha, to teachings. And then the back of it, the back of it may have the sign in, or sign or the imprints, um, a handprints of your holy lama. Incredible. Beings who have achieved some sort of enlightenment, some sort of compassion, where that can be make the tanka come to life. And when we keep these tankas well, we should keep them out as much as possible of the bedroom. As much as possible out of the bedroom, out of respect. If our place is very restricted, we have a studio apartment, we got to do everything there. All body functions there. Now what we do is this, is that we can cover it. We can put it up, it's no problem. But it's not negative karma, it's just a respect. Just because you cover it doesn't mean, you know, Zong Kabo can't see through the cover. Of course he can. <laughs> a little cover can't cover Zong Kabo. You can see, but from our side, what is it? Creating awareness. And when we show respect to enlightened beings, we create the merits to receive respect. Receive respect for what? To be a benefit to others. When people respect you, it's easier to benefit them. Much easier. So to make tankas of enlightened beings is a very powerful object. Powerful. I made huge, huge ones. I found sponsors in the past to make huge ones. You know, three, four, three, four, four or five times the size. Many, many I offered to Gandhian Monastery. Many. And the monks use it every day for worship. Many, and I've given many tankas away. And I, I like tankas, I haven't commissioned and drawn. And I give away many tankas to people. Always. Why? It's tremendous benefit. If you're in a temple, what are you coming for the temple for? You're coming to the temple to pray. If you're coming to a center, you're coming there for what? To pray. To be, to be blessed. To see visually the Holy Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So if you go to a center, it's bare. The statues are small. You need just pictures. And then the patrons, and they themselves, they have money, they can afford it, and they're cheapskates, and they don't want to. How do you create your center to grow bigger? How? So if you have, if you can raise funds, if you can do it, you should. You can make your center as beautiful as possible. Why? Because initially, when people first come in, that's what they see. And you plant seeds of enlightenment in their mind, and you encourage them. So to have a center and not have beautiful body, speech, and mind representations of the Buddha reflects the miserliness of our mind. And it can be also that we don't know the benefits. In centers where we have space, we should have big statues, big tankas, big images. It creates merit. Every day that these tankas and every day that these images exist, you collect merits. Every single person who goes and makes a wish at the holy beings, you create a cause for that. They go to an empty center, there's nothing there, what do you want them to pray to? But they're not at a level where they can see Buddha and just pray like that. For us, you know, wherever we see a statue, we go there, we pray. Where got Chinese people go inside a temple to just pray, you know, nowhere? Unless it's Jade Emperor that's outside. But, yes, so you should make your temples as beautiful and as ornate, as big as possible. And you should, make the, you should never be stingy about it. And you should never think that you lost something by sponsoring them. You don't lose anything. You gain. You gain the benefits of having holy images. Very, very beneficial. These are practices not done by Tamramji. These are practices done throughout the Buddhist world. In fact, the images are so holy, they were first allowed by Lord Buddha, who was invited to a function and who could not make it. So he, the patrons asked his permission to make his likeness, his image, so that he can grace the function and give it an aura. The Shakyamuni Buddha agreed, and that's where the tradition of Buddha images arose. He gave his permission. And then on a personal level to the king of Sri Lanka, who was too far from Bodh Gaya, where he, he was longing to see Shakyamuni so much, Shakyamuni allowed for a picture of him to be made. 
to resemble them. And Shakyamuni himself blessed it and had that picture sent to the king of Lanka for the Dharma to grow. To see a Buddha image is very blessed. It's not Buddha having a big ego and pride like he's a movie star signing it, you know, with dark glasses. He's Jackie O here. No, it's not that. He has no pride and no ego. None. So that practice comes from Buddha. And you think, oh, what's this Tibetan tanka and all that stuff with Tibetans with their statue, statue? No. Afghanistan before, look at the huge cave rock mountain carvings of Lord Buddha. You go to China, how much rock carvings are there? You go to Thailand, look at the beautiful statues they have, the temples that they have to house it. This is not a tradition of Tibet. This is a tradition of Buddhism. It's a method to purify one's karma, to generate awe and admiration in the beholder, and to plant seeds in the beholder to achieve Buddha's qualities and as an object of merit, as an object of making offerings. And for the patrons, it's wonderful. The bigger the statue, the better for the sponsors. Why? The bigger the statue, I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of calculative, the bigger the merit. Definitely. Definitely. We should never be stingy. In fact, if our budget is not that much and we want to get something, we shouldn't think, oh, I need this. We should budget ourselves out and get it. I did that for years when I was a child. Years. We should budget, we get holy images. And if we don't have space, we get holy images for other people. Because it benefits them and it has, it's beyond value. Never, ever be stingy with the Dharma. Never, ever be grasping miserly with the Dharma. Never. Never, ever. Why? It is your only hope to gain the merits to become wealthy, if that's what you want in your future lives. Like I said, going to a Dharma center, and it's not, it's, you know, people like to say it's simple. It's not really simple. It's people don't want to make an effort to make it better. Simplicity is when your mind has reached a level where simplicity is practice. But for many people, we haven't reached that level, so we need outer trappings of the three jewels. We need it. So to have a Dharma center, a sign of its growth is images. A sign. It will attract. It will bless. And the whole area where the images reside will be blessed. And that's the main reason I opened up the Dharma stores, is that I can give the opportunity to many people to bring these images home. That's the main motivation. I, mean, I have no other motivation for that. If I have any other agenda for that, it would be negative karma. Selling images and selling tankas is negative karma. Very, very negative. Very negative. So I have to be careful on that. And so what happens is that tankas is a traditional art of Tibet. They're beautiful paintings made of minerals. And on top of that, for the patron to collect merit, they'll offer gold on it. So all those things sparkling is pure gold offer. And that's not a Buddhist, that's not a Tibetan practice, that's a Buddhist practice. In other parts, you know, like in Thailand, they stick gold leaf. It's, it's not a Tibetan practice. It is universal in the Buddhist world. So to have a beautiful tanka image, imagine to have a beautiful tanka image of a particular yidam or deity you have affinity with, and to meditate and make offerings around that is very, very beautiful. It's a focus. We invest in cars, we invest in clothes, we invest in restaurants. For many people, go to a restaurant, two, three hundred dollars, nothing. You don't feel a pinch, but next day, it just comes out. You don't get anything. Never, never, never be stingy on Dharma objects, never. Always make your effort. Why? There are many benefits. I'll teach you in the future when I specifically talk about that. Many, many benefits that arise. So tankas, um, they're hung anywhere in any place, except, of course, the toilet. Even in your bedroom, it can. It depends on what your, your space situation. And modern tankas in Malaysia, you can have the brocade, or you can have it without the brocade. So you can have it with the brocade, and hang it and cover it, and you can even frame it, or you can have it without the brocade, and you can frame it as you like. You don't even have to frame it. But remember, it's an object offering. And then on the sides, we have tangtuk. It's another object offering. Those tangtuks are put on as ornamental features with the eight auspicious signs to offer silver or whatever metal, precious metals to the three jewels, precious minerals. Everything is an object of offering. Everything is an object of sight. Everything is an object to convey enlightenment, convey a spirit of enlightenment. In this tanka, it conveys the spirit of the, this lama's life, this holy lama's life, his monastery, the deities that were very connected to him, the Dharma protectors that he used to be a benefit to others, his patrons and sponsors on the bottom, and also his root lama on top. So this is a biographical tanka, what we call. So if you know the lama's life, if you look at the tanka, you immediately, it reminds you of different features, and it helps you to reflect and think of your lama and remember your lama. And it's said that it's very auspicious to have a, a tanka of your lama, or one of his previous incarnations, whatever, if, he, if that's the situation. Very auspicious. Why? For you, he's the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha. So this one's a biographical tanka, 
the Lama and by his hand gesture and what he holds and what he does, you can tell what was the main activity of his life. So in this Lama's case, the main activity of his life was giving Dharma teachings. And before Dharma teachings, contemplation. So this Lama did many, many contemplations. Many, many prayers, many contemplations. So he did a lot of meditations, retreats. This hand gesture represents that. So by looking at Tanka, you know what this Lama was pervasively doing in his life. So he did a lot of meditations. By his meditation, he holds a long life phase. The long life phase means what? By his meditations and prayers, he taught the Dharma. By teaching the Dharma, it was equivalent to giving people immortality, to be free from samsara and his fears and his pitfalls, to heal people, to help people. And then the Lama is holding a stem of a lotus with that a Dharma text and, and a sword that represents that this Lama had great knowledge, was very learned, was a master scholar holding a Dharma text because it represents he understands Dharma. And the sword on top represents that he was an excellent teacher, penetrative, very sharp and very quick like a sword. So they're likening him to having the, like the blessings of Lord Manjushri to, to be a benefit to others. And then um, behind him are beautiful trees and beautiful fruit trees to represent that when you have connection to this Lama, fruits like a fruit tree will bear. Your practice, your needs and wants will arise like fruits. It represents the power of this Lama. And he wears the golden hat of one of the... Why that hat is not worn by any monk or any teacher? you have to be of certain caliber or rank. So this Lama must have great rank, must have been hierarchically very high due to his attainments, to wear a hat of a great pandita, a great pandita. And uh, he sits on a meditation cushion, representing, again, his main focus is meditation. And his legs are in a meditative position, representing, again, he engaged in many practices. Some Lamas are in debate pose. Some Lamas are in standing pose. They, they have many actions in different lifetimes. This one pervasively meditation and teaching. And his face, in this case, was unlike the compassionate Kuan Yin, who's smiling and nice and gentle and whatever. This Lama has a fierce demeanor. His eyes are fierce, his brows are twitched together, and he has a look of slight wrath, meaning this Lama used wrathful methods to subdue problems and difficulties and to subdue his students. So most likely this Lama um, manifested hot temper, hot mouth, and very direct, very direct. So his face takes on a demeanor of wrath, meaning he used four powers, peace, increase, wrath, control. So these are the four enlightened powers of a Buddha. He used the method of wrath pervasively to subdue and control. So during his life, maybe there were very different difficult factions and difficult people and difficult situations where if they were controlled, the Dharma can grow. His patrons, his patrons and his sponsors were not ordinary because he was a very high, renowned Lama. His patrons and sponsors uh, and his students were the kings of Mongolia, mainly. So the emperors and the kings of Mongolia and the royal family represented there, used to bring many offerings to him and make offerings to him and then sponsor his activities. They were his patrons. And so if the royalty came, you can imagine that many, many, many students came to him. He has hundreds and thousands of students. So in his pervasive action, again, is teaching the Dharma from meditative experiences. So from that tanka alone, it tells a story. And if you understand the symbolism behind it, for people, for many people in Tibetan tradition who are illiterate, it helps a lot. And for highly literate people, scholars and masters and meditation masters and stuff, it's a quick reminder instantly of what this Lama pervasively did. And it's easier, why? Then when the student relates to this tanka and makes offerings and prays, there's, there's a focus. They know what they're praying for. May I become like you, Lama? May I be able to experience meditative practices? May I stay in retreats? May I, and the leg represents focus and taming the monkey mind. And the hand represents total confidence in teaching, meaning arisen from personal practice. And the face is using wrath. Why? Mostly we associate wrath with some kind of anger. But if this Lama can use wrath and not go to hell and still have so many students, his wrath must be Vajra wrath. Vajra wrath meaning the type of wrath that is ferocious, that purifies your karma. And if you're a student who has merits and you understand the nature and you can fight your own ego, if you're lucky, the Lama will shout and be very fierce with you. The more a Lama shouts at a student is a representative of how powerful the student's self-grasping mind is and how the student cannot break their habits. And the Lama will be very compassionate to put themselves in that type of position to shout and tell off that student. And only a being with very good, very good motivation 
is able to use wrath and not go to hell for it. And in fact, lamas will shout at students and the Dharma will grow. People like us shout at people, they go away. Why? The motivation and the practice is not there. And many, many highly developed lamas will use wrath. Song Rinchi was well known for his wrath. Very rarely does he smile. People shivered near him. But when you listen to him, when you watch his actions, you know he's an enlightened being. So this lama pervasively used wrath to convey the Dharma and to subdue students and subjugate. And he did a lot of meditations and prayers. And he, his main activity was teaching the Holy Dharma. Main activity. And his, his root lama is His Holiness, the first pension lama floating in the sky. Why? Even though this lama is very high, even higher than him is his root lama. So even such a high personage will put their root lama on top of them to show respect to the lama. And then his meditational practices were pervasively great yamantaka, dispeller of fear and death, creator of magical abilities, yamantaka. From yamantaka's practice, one can gain magical abilities very quick. Heruka was his other practice. Hiruka, with his 12 arms, releases us from the 12 interdependent links of samsara. With his four faces, he pervades the four directions, with his compassion, with his laugh, with his gestures. Hiruka is very famous for his laugh. The minute he laughs, the spirits and obstructors run. Demons take flight. He has a very powerful laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Enlightened. And for us, when we hear the laugh, it destroys our demons. Self-delusions, illusions, hatred is subdued and suppressed by Hiruka's laugh. And he's holding his consort. Represented that this Yidam is so powerful that even engaged in sexual embrace, he commits no negative offense. Then the third deity that he, was, he practiced very much was Madhyogini, the one that rescues sentient beings. Especially now, it's very pertinent, very pertinent for those who have little merit wants great benefit and small practice and not so complicated, yet the, all the benefits are there. Vajigani, who perpetually looks into the sky, is telling you where she can lead you at this time. And her body doesn't have many arms, doesn't have many clothes, doesn't have many heads and legs. Why? To show you that her practice is simple. And it's easy. But it's beneficial. Its benefits are exactly like any other tantra. Exactly. And her red body represents the ultimate nature of great compassion and great love for others. And her non-attachment to samsara represents her nakedness, always perpetually looking and facing the sky. Why? She is letting you know, I will take you there. I'll take you to Kichara Paradise. So this Lama pervasively practiced this in his monasteries in the background, what he belonged to. And then his patrons are there listening to him, getting his dharma. Actually, when we paint biographical, biographical tankas, it's very auspicious to paint a lot of students. If you put a lama in just a few students, it's not very auspicious. Why? It's like, oh, he didn't have many students. So when we paint tankas of the lamas, of our gurus, of our masters, you know what happens? It helps to remind the student and reminds them of who their lama is and what they're able to do to help the lama to do the same thing in this life. And so when we paint the lama's tankas, we should paint a lot of figures filled with a lot of students because if they were that great, they definitely had that. You know, you don't put two or three students that are hanging out there offering jade and metal. You know, it's like, what? Poor Lama. And then the practices that he did was the Holy Setra and the Four-Face Mahakala, which definitely, why do they put below the Lama? Because this Lama is apparently accomplished. He's accomplished, therefore, he doesn't ask the Dharma protectors to do things. He orders them. So he has realized some sort, he has some sort of very strong commitment, realized emptiness, that where he actually commands and orders the Dharma protectors to do this, this, and this, and this. So one who respects the Lama will have the blessing of the Yidam, will have the blessing of the Dharma protectors. One who only respects the Yidam and not the Lama, the benefits will be much less. One who does Dharma protector practice very well, but does not have faith in the Lama or respect for the Lama, the Dharma pr protector can do very little for you. Why? Why? How can you expect a son or a daughter to love you if you're always trying to hate their parents? Not possible. So if the Dharma protectors respect the Lama so much, the Lama must have some qualities that we don't see. 
And then how did he gain those qualities? From the practice of tantras, which is showing you openly. And the Lama has passed away, therefore they can show you the Yidams. Actually, during the lifetime of the Lama, they will not reveal the Yidams at all. Yidam practices are very secret. So since the Lama has passed away and he's gone, he's already achieved his attainment, nothing can be taken away. They put the Yidams there openly. So that's not the only Yidams and practices he did. There's much, much more, but those are the main ones he used to benefit others. To destroy and dispel obstacles of others, he would use Yamataka. To free people of extreme grasping and desire, he would use Haruka. And to give hope to those who have no hope, to give of lazy disposition, backward mentality, no discipline and control, he conferred Vajagini onto them so that they do not have to suffer. So this, this, this is the total biographical tanka, biographical. And so there's a distinction between this one and this one. If you look at the bottom, this has a red patch, this one has no patch. What that represents is, it's another way of making extra offering, because sometimes we can't afford very nice brocade, so we get one square brocade that's very expensive and offered onto that, that we may gain the merits. So what happens is that, that we call the door of the tanka, which is how we enter into that realm. I mean, it's symbolic. So like this one, oh, you can't see, symbolic. So tankas are very beautiful ways to express a lama's biography, visions, spiritual places, attainments. Example, a mandala, tanka, of Yamataka, Hiruka, Vajugini, Kala Chakra, a mandala. If you know how to look at it and read it, it's a total illustration of the qualities of that deity and what that particular practice emphasizes to become enlightened. Example, in the Hiruka, Guya Samaja, and Yamantaka Tantras, the eight cemeteries that surround are outside the Vajra wall. Oh, wait. Yeah. In Vajuginis, it's the opposite. There's symbolic meaning, very significant. Why that practice focuses on specific practices and specific delusions to become enlightened. So they're very great guides, great meditational pieces. And we have tankas. It's a great object of making offerings and prostrations, great gift for people. The minute you bring a tanka into a room, it's consecrated. It blesses the whole area, it brings peace and brings happiness. And you know all of you work so hard and you make money, you should get the best result of your money. Not just food and clothes, but spiritual items of spiritual value that every day you can gain merits. Why else do you work so hard? You can't take it with you. Why else? And the best is to erect beautiful things in our home, yes, but more so in the centers and temples. Why? Because hundreds and thousands of people get benefit for many, many years. Many. And that came from us. We can dedicate a statue. We can make a beautiful Lama Tsongkhapa statue, a big one, dedicate someone's center for someone else who's sick or for our lineage, for our father and mother who's passed away, who's been very kind to us. Don't just say they're kind and go to the, their graveyards, cheng bang, go like that, eat chicken, give them chicken. They can't have it. They already took rebirth. You go cheng bang, you just cheng bang yourself. Why? You don't, you're the only one eating what? They're not going to eat. They're not going to eat anything. No offense intended. But if you make a statue dedicated to the people that you love that are passed away and you dedicate it to them and people make offerings, some of the merits can go to them. Much more beneficial. So do you have a mother and father that's been very kind to you? Oh, you should dedicate it for them. You should do it for them always, again and again. Repay their kindness. Why? Where are they going to take rebirth? Ultimately, what can you do for them except give them some relief from samsara? And to have the honor to work in a dharma store, to disseminate the knowledge of tankas and statues to other people. You should pay them and not you get paid to do this job. Why? Extremely beneficial. Extremely. Extremely. So when we look at each tanka, we can get a history, we can understand. And when we look at the deities, we know that this deity pervasively uses what energy and what method to bring us to enlightenment. You'll know by the way they sit, their color, their iconography, their mount, like what animal they're sitting on, if it's a man or throne, you'll understand totally their nature. If you understand the nature of deities, the Dharma. Why all tankas of deities are iconographical, iconography of the stages and steps to enlightenment. That's what it is. So therefore, to see it, it gives you great blessing. Why? It's a physical, drawn-out map to enlightenment in an iconographical form, iconography form. So if you, know, if you know the Dharma, and you look at it, you understand. 
If you look at that, you'll be able to teach the Dharma from a Tanka. Just from a Tanka, if you know the Dharma, you'll be able to teach the Dharma from a Tanka. Why? And then from the deities, the way they sit, they're coloring, all that. From that, you can weave the Dharma in between their body, what they look like, the color. Why is that? Because you know the Dharma and you know how it represents. And seeing that represents one section of the Dharma you can explain to others. So if you know the Dharma, it is a physical drawing or a map to enlightenment. It's very, very powerful, very significant. Very, 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 very powerful. And so, um, this art is not just an art, but it's, it is definitely a very powerful visual method for enlightenment. Very, very powerful. That's what Tanka is all about. And then, uh, along with that, we offer brocade onto them. We offer brocade onto them in order to gain merit. Merit not alone. Merit for what? For the destruction of what that brocade represents. That brocade mainly, has many meanings, represents attachment to tactile feeling. We like to touch nice things. We like to have nice things. We are attracted to tactile feeling. And being attracted to tactile feeling and chasing after tactile feeling creates more desire and then we chase more and more and more and more. Some people can touch a piece of cloth and have an orgasm and scream and die. Why? They have this misconception and label view that if I have this and I touch this, it will bring me happiness. Whereas actually a cover, not a bad cover, that they don't even know. So having attachment to tactile feelings creates a lot of problems for us. Offering brocade up, offering brocade up is a way of destroying tactile attachment out of the five senses. Visual, smell, excuse me, hearing, taste, touch. So one of the main methods to destroy tactile feeling.